Hey everyone, so we are going to be getting into the intrinsic motivation part of this chapter. So what is intrinsic motivation and why is it so important? So this idea of intrinsic motivation is really one of the biggest things that you should take away from this sports psychology class. These people who are intrinsically motivated, um, these individuals who have this inner self-determined type motivation, they're just the type of people who want to be competent and just get better at the task at hand, right? Get better at this certain skill. And so there, there are keywords here, um, self-determination, that you're gonna see in just a moment. And that works on a continuum. Basically, if you're intrinsically motivated, your motivation is determined by you and you're in full control of that, right? There, you're not dependent on someone else or something else, right? Some sort of reward or based on some, someone else to get you to feel motivated. And so that can be really powerful because you really, that means you don't need anyone, anyone else to get you motivated to do something. It's all within you. As a coach, you want to create this climate of intrinsic motivation, not have your athletes dependent on you being there in order for them to be motivated, right? So you're trying to make your swimmers be really hard, uh, work hard and be leaders and show good worth ethics, right? So when you're not there, hopefully that behavior still exists, right? Hopefully they're still working as hard as if you were there at practice, that would mean that your athletes are intrinsically motivated and they're going to continue to follow the training that was set out for them. They're not doing it just because the coach is there and they will see me. They're doing it because they want to get better. So that brings us to self-determination theory, which again is a very important theory. There are a few sub theories to self-determination theory, which can get a little bit complicated, but today we're going to be going over two of the main ones. So make sure you understand what this means. Self-determination doesn't mean determination like you might be used to. It, it doesn't quite mean, you know, being determined, like persistent in that re regard, but self-determination theory rather is talking about that intrinsic motivation where the motivation comes from within you and nothing external to you. So intrinsic motivation can essentially be measured on this continuum, right? So as you can see here, you have intrinsic motivation equals high self-determination here on the right. And low self-determination is what we refer to here as A motivation. And so A motivation is essentially meaning not motivated. A meaning not motivation, not motivated. Two very opposite ends of the spectrum here. So low self-determination means you're not motivated at all. And then intrinsic motivation, you are high, highly self-determined. So there are various versions of extrinsic motivation. And those are things that involve some level of external control. And as you can see here, there's this threshold of autonomy. Here we are finally in control of some of these things as we move to the right. From here on to the left side, this is very not in our control, um, separated from us. And then as we move towards this threshold of autonomy, things are becoming more and more in our control until we keep going and we hit this extrinsic motivation portion. And so, like I said, we have here a motivation, meaning not motivated. And essentially at this part of the continuum, you are indifferent, right? You don't care. You're kind of just going through the motions. There, there's no sort of any sort of motivation that's causing you to do something. And then we move to the right and we hit this extrinsic motivation, which is all external types of rewards and things like that. Um, that we can get and causes us to, again, participate in our activity, right? So we have here furthest to the left is the most extrinsic, which is external regulation. And really this is more of your material type objects that you can receive for participating in something, right? Um, usually this is money, this is a new car, trophies, things like that. Those are all externally regulated types of motivation. 
And then you move on to the next thing, which is interjected. So here you do something because of more of the pressures that are around you, right? So you do it because you're trying, you, maybe you work out because you are trying to impress a member of the opposite sex, or maybe an athlete is motivated to put in some work because they want to be recruited by a particular coach. It's still externally related because you are doing it for someone else to see you and that makes it interjected. And then as we pass through interjected, um, we start getting into this phase where autonomy starts to occur, right? Autonomy is now present as we move towards this identified part of the continuum. And so identified is when you feel that what you're doing is a want rather than an ought. This is your willingness to do something. It's more of a choice here. And you're doing it because you know it's important and you sort of value it, but it's still, you might not like it. Exercise, it falls into here a lot. Like you recognize its importance and you want to do it but it's still not fully extrinsic or excuse me, it's still not fully intrinsic because you don't necessarily want to do it, even though you have identified that it is important. Next, you have integrated, which is still considered extrinsic motivation, but it's very much because the individual values the outcome that comes out of it, right? So this activity, this particular activity is important to me and I value the outcome rather than the actual activity itself, right? So again, intrinsic motivation, you're, you're doing the activity because you wanna get better at it and you like the activity. Here, you're doing it because you value the outcome. So maybe you're running a marathon because it's on your bucket list. This is true for me. Um, running a marathon was on my bucket list and I was able to do it and I did not like doing it, but the outcome of doing it was important for me. So being able to complete it was important for me because it was something I could cross off my, bu my bucket list. So um, that was very much an integrated activity for me. Okay, and then now we are moving towards the more high self-determination, intrinsically motivated part of the continuum, right? So stimulation, this one you do it because you do an activity because it makes you feel good, um, because of the pleasure, fun, excitement you feel, you want to feel happy. Those are sort of rewards, but it's more intrinsic, right? It's, it's internal to you, which is why it's considered intrinsic motivation. Then you have accomplishment, which again is the pleasure and satisfaction that you feel after you felt accomplished. Okay, so Rather than just being stimulated and excited, this is more of the feeling of accomplishment that you get. The highest self-determined point of the continuum is knowledge. This is when you simply do something just because you want to learn, right? And you want to try something new. And that is the highest sort of level, most self-determined level of motivation. So these days, it's really hard to know who does what for intrinsic motivation, right? We have social media and people always wanting to show their progress and have other people see what they're doing. So is that if you're working out and you are, you know, filming yourself every day and you're posting it, why are you actually doing it? Are you actually doing it for the feeling of accomplishment and stimulation? Or is it external regulation, um, you know, getting the likes? Um, or are you trying to impress someone in that interjected portion of extrinsic motivation? So something to think about when you are thinking about your own motives for doing certain things. Extrinsic motivation is temporary. It comes and goes because it's related to something external to you. And so we want to always strive to have that intrinsic motivation um, so that we are in charge of our own motives and, you know, no one can take that away from us, right? We can keep going because we are intrinsically motivated. So here are some factors influencing intrinsic motivation. 
Um, a lot of them are social factors, right? So this includes th what comes from success and failure, right? People might be motivated in order to achieve success or to at least avoid failure. Um, some people are really focused on the competition and might be motivated based on that competition, right? If you are competing someone who's challenging for you and you're intrinsically motivated, then you are probably really pumped to be challenged and to get that, that stimulation, right? Um, we're also looking at coaches' behavior, which is a huge factor in this. Um, so the type of environment that they set up, again, we talked about motivational climate with a task and ego-oriented climates. Those also are part of this coach's behavior and can influence the type of motivation that is set up for their teams. We also have psychological factors, and we're going to talk about need for compassion, autonomy, and relatedness in just a second. Um, but there's a passion, right? If we have passion, um, then we are most likely to be more intrinsically motivated um, in the activity that we want to do because we love it. And so here we have the three basic psychological needs as explained by the self-determination theory, which says that the degree to which people are satisfied of these three basic psychological needs, that determines how intrinsically motivated a person is. So autonomy is the need for one to feel like they made their own decisions and had input, their own input in um, the decisions they made. Competence is the feeling of being self-sufficient and feeling confident in their skill. And then relatedness is a feeling of belonging um, in a group or with other people, feeling connected to other people. And so as these three needs get satisfied, right? So we want to feel high autonomy, high competence, and high relatedness. If those things are all high, then we are most likely to be in that intrinsically motivated, self-determined part of the continuum. Everything we do, we are trying to fulfill these three needs, the need to feel competent, the need to have autonomy and feel like our decisions are our own, and then the feeling of relatedness and being connected with other people. So as a coach, you might want to try as much as possible to fulfill these needs for your athletes, right? So how are you allowing them to be more connected with each other? How are you bringing a sense of belonging to the group? Are you giving them autonomy? Are you giving them decisions in how they train? Um, if they feel like they are, then they're, they're probably going to be more, more motivated, right, to train. And then the feeling of competence. So are you reinforcing that they are doing well, um, that they're improving, learning, all those things? So as a coach, you want to make sure that those three needs are being met in whatever environment, training environment you're in, so that your athletes are more intrinsically motivated. All right, intrinsic motivation and extrinsic rewards. Do extrinsic rewards undermine intrinsic motivation? What a great question. Well, it shows that being paid for working on an intrinsically interesting activity can decrease a person's intrinsic motivation for the activity. So in other words, yes. Putting an extrinsic reward to something will usually decrease a person's intrinsic motivation for it. So let's say you are a college athlete and you are getting a scholarship for playing on a team. Scholarship can generally be seen as an extrinsic motivation. It's an extrinsic reward. It's money. It's that external regulation that we discussed earlier versus an athlete who plays club, right? So you don't get paid to play club. If anything, you might have to pay to play. So who is likely to have more intrinsic motivation? It's probably that club player because they're really doing it because they love the sport versus not saying college scholarship athletes lose intrinsic motivation, but they do have that external reward 
that big that becomes very important right that becomes very important in why they play so you can sort of see how putting an extrinsic price on something can decrease a person's intrinsic motivation so it's not to say that all external rewards are bad right we have some suggestions here for how to use external rewards. And so the best type of external rewards are novel, created, and simple. And the meaning is more important than their monetary value. So these are probably like team awards. If you're voted most improved on the team by your teammates, those are more rewarding just because of the meaning of it rather than what it's actually worth. Um, we have extrinsic rewards should be given to enable athletes and not control them. Extrinsic rewards can help when individuals are not motivated to participate, right? So if we have someone on that far left part of the continuum where they're a motivated, extrinsic rewards will help them get just a little bit further to the right of that continuum, right? If you have that some sort of extrinsic external regulation reward. Extrinsic rewards should be contingent on behavior and use extrinsic rewards sparingly. So don't want to always, always use extrinsic rewards to motivate your athletes. Just a general rule of thumb. All right, here's just a quick slide on coaching, autonomy, supportive coaching versus controlling coaching. Um, again, you want to be part of this autonomy, supportive role versus controlling. Um, you can take a look at these. We're not. I'm not going to go into it very much, but some important things to consider, especially if you are a coach, about how you run your team and what makes a very more intrinsically motivating environment for your, for your athletes. All right, so lastly today, we're going to be talking about flow and the flow state. So this is a really optimal form of intrinsic motivation. These are the moments when I'm sure a lot of you can relate when you're performing at a super high level, basically feels like you, you weren't even trying, that it just came to you. It's very much like a Zen state when you're in a rhythm and it's quite literally feels like the easiest thing that you've ever done. Let's define flow really quickly. Flow is a holistic, intrinsically motivating sensation that people feel when they are totally involved in an activity or are on autopilot. And the flow model describes the essential elements of flow. And we'll get into that in just a second. Okay, so I'm just gonna show this quick video. It's a great video that briefly shows um, flow state and has some extreme sport athletes explain what flow state is like for them. <laughs> You've got about an inch of ice in between you that is life. And then you see the valley floor a thousand feet below you. I was sliding out of control. I was going towards the crowd. I can remember still what the rock looked like, right? When I grabbed the rope, the shine of the rope, something in me knew I was going to maybe die right then. You're in a state of absolute awareness without any effort. It's definitely the highest form of concentration I've ever experienced. And I'm just perceiving things much more clearly, much more slowed down than normal. It's when you're fully in sync, when you're making perfect decisions, pretty much everything falls away. The superior form of consciousness. It's basically where life makes sense. We can use the action of adventure sport athletes as case studies. We can apply this knowledge across all demands of society. We call this experience flow because the sensation part is that every action, every decision leads seamlessly, fluidly to the next. It's technically defined as a state of consciousness where we feel our best and we perform our best. You have to find a state of mind where, you know, you're able to make fast decisions that you aren't even aware that you're making. Pattern recognition, future prediction, information processing. These skills are massively, massively amplified. So flow heightens intellectual performance, heightens creative performance and heightens physical performance. A lot of athletes that I work with basically wouldn't feel like they're alive if they didn't have it. That's the only reason I'm putting myself in harm's way is for the heightened awareness. It's hard to put words to it, but it's addictive. And that's what drives me to come back and do it again. 
every action, every decision leads seamlessly, fluidly to the next. Being able to take those steps, slow them down, watch the videotape in your head, and then once you connected all of the dots, push the play button and it speeds back up and then you roll away. Time dilates. Sometimes it slows down like in a car crash with that freeze frame effect. Sometimes it speeds up and five hours pass by five minutes. And the moment that everything slows down is that perfect moment of flow and nothing is rushed because a second is a hell of a long time. And I think everyone has tapped into flow at some point in their life that time where time stood still, yet everything happened with infinite clarity. That's the best part, is kind of letting go and seeing where it takes you. Knowing that you know you have the capability to make those decisions, but kind of letting it happen. When it becomes your purpose, some people are gonna get it, and some people won't. So the question at the heart of Rise of Superman is what the hell's going on? Where is this coming from? And the answer is that these athletes have become better at hacking the state of flow than anybody else in the history of the world. Okay, so let's get into the flow model. And so this particular model is important to understand, right? There's tons and tons of research in sports psychology on flow. And here it sort of explains it as this interaction of skills of an individual, right? So we have the challenge of the task, which is either high or low going up and down. And then we have either a match between above average high skills and then all the way down here to the left of low skills, a low skill set. And so here at the high skills, high challenge quadrant, we have an athlete who has that, that opportunity to experience flow. So if you have an athlete here with high skills, but the challenge is low, it's likely that they are not going to hit flow because they're bored, right? They're not being challenged at all. If the challenge is high, but the skill is low, then as you can imagine, that athlete might be anxious and they might be really in their head about the situation and what's going on and what they have to do, all those things. And then if you have challenge is low and skill is low, then you have someone who probably doesn't care, right? They are falling asleep. They don't really care about what's happening. They can't do it. They don't wanna do it. We have your apathy. And so in order for an athlete to achieve flow, there needs to be a match between the challenge of the task and that could be either the opponent or a level of training and then level of their own skill. As we saw in the video, we have high performance, um, sort of extreme sport athletes. And so as you can imagine, that requires high skill and the challenges are high, right? If you're um, free climbing, that is extremely scary and ex it takes a lot of skill and must be very challenging. And so they are probably the ones who will experience flow um, fl the most, right? Or who can experience it very often because they are constantly challenging themselves and um, doing something that not, not many people can do. I know I couldn't do it. And so be familiar with these features of flow and, and this diagram. Here, we're gonna talk about a few of the essential elements of flow. So what you need in order to experience flow. Again, that balance of challenge and skills, meeting the challenge, complete absorption in the activity. So um, your mind has to be completely focused on, on this activity and you have to be present where you are. You have to have clear goals. A merging of action and awareness needs to occur, meaning you are less in your head about it. So there's this lack of thought um, and you're just, you're just doing it, right? Um, it's that merging of action and awareness. Total concentration on the task at hand. Everything around you is sort of gone. If there is a crowd or crowd noises, everything that's a distraction is just gone and they don't matter. There's a loss of self-consciousness. So the example in the book talks about a climber melting into a rock, but essentially you sort of just lose focus on yourself and just 
do what you got to do. You're not really thinking about yourself in the moment. You have a sense of control at what you're doing. There's no goals or rewards external to the activity. It means you're just doing it for the activity itself because you want to do it. There's a sense of self-satisfaction that comes with this. A transformation of time. So like in the video, they explain that five hours could feel like five minutes and time tends to slow down. And then lastly, this effortless movement where you're not even thinking about what you're doing. It's all very effortless, like you're on autopilot. And so, like I mentioned, there's a lot of research done on flow states, but it's something that in my opinion is difficult to study because it's not something we really can control. Research shows that with athletes, they indicated that they cannot control flow at all, but they did report that they can increase the probability of it occurring. And so that is what we can do as coaches, as sports psychologists, is help our athletes to increase that probability of it occurring. Because if they do, they perform better, and it means that they are in feeling that intrinsic motivation. And so a couple thoughts on how to achieve it. One is being motivated to perform. So maintaining a balance between goals and skills. Make sure you achieve optimal arousal before performing. We're going to be talking about that quite a bit in the arousal chapter. So stay tuned. Maintain an appropriate focus. So stay in the present and focus on the key things that you need to do in your competition. Use pre-competitive and competitive plans and preparation achieve optimal physical preparation and readiness. So make, again, make sure you have the skills to do it and you're in the best shape possible to, to do what you need to do. Experience optimal environmental and situational conditions. So your environment needs to be the best it can be. Make sure you exhibit confidence and positive mental attitude. So going into things with positive self-talk and confidence, have positive team play and interaction. We see this a lot, I, I want to say, in like basketball games, right, uh, where the, the whole team is just jiving and feeling great. Whole teams can get into a flow state, right? We see in basketball competitions all the time, there's players that get the hot hand and the rest of their team just sort of feeds off of that. That's super awesome flow state. And then feeling good about your performance. So again, with that positive attitude. And using mindfulness techniques. So again, being present in the moment, being aware of your thoughts, but not letting it control you. And so here are a couple of things that prevent flow from occurring. Pretty much the opposite of what we have just gone through. Okay, I forgot there were quite a few of these. So as you can see, there were a lot of factors that prevent you, prevent flow from occurring, which is why it's harder for it to occur than not occur. Okay. So a lot of things that can make it not happen, which is why you got to focus on the things that will make it happen more often. And just as I mentioned, the one negative side of flow is that you can't control it, which means you should not depend on it for your performance. Developing a dependence on it can be really negative because it, it might not always occur at every competition or at every activity that you do. Just knowing that it can happen, but it won't always, so don't depend on it. And then down here it says surf surfers have found it to be an addictive euphoric feeling and wanted to continue to surf despite the feeling, excuse me, despite family commitments, injury, or potential death to replicate these sensations. So getting addicted to the feeling of flow um, is probably more referring to the extreme sport athletes that being addicted to it can, can be dangerous because you're going to put yourself in situations that can be very dangerous and cause you injury or death. So be careful. All right, that is it for today. Thanks everyone. See you next week.